So what are the recommendations in short then for those who are in the gray area, for those who have this sluggish thyroid? You can retest and monitor every three to six months and see does your TSH ever consistently exceed seven to 10. Look at your TPO levels. Are they over 500? Then this would mean you have increased risk for becoming hypothyroid. Consider your family history. Is there a strong family history? This is one thing that seems really left out of the equation when we're screening someone for the viability of the diagnosis of hypothyroid to see if they're in that 37% of people who don't actually need the hormone, we'll look at really basic things. Are you the only person in your family with hypothyroid? That's odd. Who diagnosed you? An anti-aging clinic. They're a little bit quick to give hormones, right? So these things are not too hard to get a sense for when you look at the data objectively. And then you can use certain supplements to help support maintaining normal thyroid function. A 2013 randomized control trial gave people with sluggish thyroid selenium and myoinositol. And after six months, they found a decrease in TSH, a decrease in thyroid antibodies, and an improvement in the appearance of the thyroid gland on ultrasound. The typical protocols used here are 83 micrograms of selenium and 600 milligrams of myoinositol. So that's one option. Another option is vitamin D. Three separate meta-analyses have found that vitamin D can lower TPO antibodies. So another option. At a dose between 1,000 and 8,000 IUs per day for between three and six months. And often overlooked would be probiotics. This is from a 2017 randomized control trial that gave people who were on thyroid hormone probiotics. They found that those taking the probiotic required less medication over time, and those in the control or the placebo group needed more medication over time. Now, why is this? Well, often overlooked, really important, and what we've published on, some symptoms come from the gut and they're blamed on thyroid brain fog, fatigue, poor nutrient absorption, therefore perhaps dry skin or, or thinning hair. But also remember that if you're taking something like levothyroxine or armor, that is contingent upon absorption. And if absorption isn't good because gut health is somewhat impaired, then you can be like the control group here who needed more medication over time because they don't have good absorption or the probiotic group needed less medication over time ostensibly because they were absorbing the medication better. So this is not an exhaustive list. I don't wanna to go too far afield into treatment options, but just to hit a few of the key points in terms of what you can do to be preventative and also restorative for thyroid hormone function or to restore normal symptoms. If you have low T3, a few comments, it could be, that the low T3 is because of low T4. Because remember, T4 is converted into T3. So if you have low T4, then that could be the simple obvious cause of the low T3. However, if your T4 levels are normal and you have low T3, again, looking at the ranges on the labs and not what someone else is writing in, not the theoretical ranges, really important clarification, then it could be the problem with insulation. This is where a diet too low in calories or too low in carbs, high levels of stress or inflammation are all akin to leaving a window open. And here's one scenario I've called out before, and I, I just want to issue this caution again. If we have a skewed perspective on Hashimoto's, if we think Hashimoto's guarantees hypothyroid, so we don't understand the risk correctly. Additionally, if we have incorrect information regarding interpretation of the levels, so 40 is looked at as a high risk level. What this can lead to is people over treating Hashimoto's and saying, well, you've got to cut out all gluten, all dairy, better yet still cut out all grains completely and even go on the autoimmune paleo diet. And this can lead to firstly, psychological stress, but secondly, this is where some people are made worse because that diet or those dietary recommendations can lead to too low calorie and too low carb. So in some cases, the simplest thing you can do to improve your health is have an accurate appreciation for the risk posed by Hashimoto's so that you don't overly restrict your diet. Now, certainly improving one's diet quality is important, but there is such a thing as going too far. Let me give you one other example. 
And big thank you and credit to Dr. Robert Abbott, who published this study. He's a colleague and a friend. They took people who were on a baseline paleo-like diet that was gluten-free. They put them on the AIP diet. So they went from baseline paleo-like gluten-free to then autoimmune paleo, much more restrictive. They found no improvements in thyroid autoimmunity. So what I would argue is that the people who are on the diet that's harder to adhere to may be more prone to exhibit symptoms of caloric or carbohydrate insufficiency. Now, full disclosure, the people in that group who went on the AIP diet, they saw improved symptoms. But part of the intervention was also counseling, stress management, and community support. So it's really hard to disentangle those two in terms of you're showing up, you're having attention, community, therapy, that's probably going to go a long way in improving someone's symptoms. Overcorrecting with diet can actually make you feel worse. And I'm hoping that all these sort of data points are connecting and helping you to see how to navigate the, the accurate center ground here and not get too far in either extreme. Okay, so then summarizing all of this in this table, Hashimoto's, specifically TPO antibodies, detectable above 35, at risk above 500. Sluggish thyroid. TSH, anywhere from 4.5 up to 7, maybe 10, paired with normal free T4. At risk Hashimoto's and sluggish thyroid. TPO above 500, TSH above 4.5 up to 7 to 10, and normal free T4. Hypothyroid, antibodies don't matter because antibodies don't diagnose hypothyroid. TSH above 4.5, importantly, paired with with low free T4. Quick caveat here, if your TSH is 5.5 and your free T4 is 0.5, your doctor astutely may say, let's retest because you're not very far from the range. Normally, when people have hypothyroid, there is a drastic elevation in the TSH, 20, 40, 50. There was one paper, and I may be slightly off my numbers here, but that found the average TSH at time of diagnosis was something like 50. So bear that in mind with the hypothyroid diagnosis. And then at risk Hashimoto's with hypothyroid is TPO antibodies above 500, along with the TSH above 4.5 paired with low free T4 below 0.8. In recap, the thermostat is a pituitary and hypothalamus detecting heat or detecting levels of thyroid hormone. The heater, is the thyroid gland T4, free T4, and the insulation is T3. Hashimoto's, or autoimmunity, is something to pay attention to, but the risk that poses is often not discussed correctly. Remember, 75% of those with Hashimoto's will maintain normal function. 25 will become hypothyroid. Regarding hypothyroid, we provided interpretation guidelines, and to be cautious, that your clinician has not been too quick to diagnose you hypothyroid and put you on medication because as we covered, 37% of people, according to the meta-analysis from the journal Thyroid, were able to stop their hormone, maintain normal thyroid levels all on their own, and had no change in symptoms. And then finally, regarding sluggish thyroid, the majority, 74%, will become normal with time. You can use certain supplements to increase the odds of maintaining normal thyroid function. And medication does not appear to help sluggish thyroid unless the TSH is above somewhere between seven to 10. Hopefully that helps you. This is a combination of, of positions that are sometimes adopted by conventional medicine and sometimes adopted by alternative medicine. And what I've attempted to do for you is just give you what the science supports. We do have adequate science here, like I mentioned earlier, so we can be confident in these conclusions. And again, hopefully they help you reconcile the different things you hear from different camps. I think conventional medicine has some right here. Alternative medicine has some right here. And that's what I've attempted to distill down into these guidelines for you today. Alrighty, this is Dr. Ruscio, and I hope this helps. 